Welcome to Stitch, where we recognize the feel good, do good, and all around good from across the country. I'm Allie Ross. More and more people are doing their part to help the planet by living more sustainably. Environmentally responsible businesses are more popular than ever. People are finding innovative and creative ways to live. Trash can become treasure thanks to creative, green thinking minds. Here's Devante McKenneth with stories of two ventures that are making eco-living more attainable. What we quickly realized is that we wanted to make sustainability approachable. Jamie Fairman is a business owner in Old Louisville, Kentucky. She offers sustainable products at her plant store, Forage, but quickly realized the idea needed a space of its own. So when we couldn't find it, we decided to build it ourselves. Customers can bring their own containers to be filled or refilled, cutting down on packaging waste, especially plastics. Shampoos, conditioners, lotions and deodorants to your household cleaning supplies. So you're all purpose cleaners, white vinegars, baking soda, and laundry detergent. If you have that salsa jar that you just went through, clean it on out, bring it on in, and we'll fill it up with whatever you would like. The maple danish? Yeah. Oh, excellent. Those are a bit farther north, among delicious pastries, breakfast sandwiches, and coffee in this Baltimore shop, you'll also find locally made, low-waste products available for refills. When people come in and they bring their used plastic Windex bottle or detergent bottle and they come over and they fill up, it, it's fabulous because that saves the bottle from going in the landfill. Along with treats and refills, the Moncton Refillery and Coffee Bar offers education on how to reduce, reuse, and recycle at home. Recycling is a difficult process. Paper and glass are the easiest to recycle. Plastic is not so easy. So people understand, it's all about re-education. For these business owners, making green living accessible for their customers is top priority. Sustainability often gets a negative connotation of being expensive, and we really want to debunk that by providing the bulk refillery there to the communities that we exist in. We realize that everybody is on a different journey, and there is no right or wrong way to do it. It's about making the choices that make the most sense for you in your life. Up next, a small business is offering a more environmentally conscious way for its community to collect trash one bicycle ride at a time. In the scheme of things, yeah, it's really small, but it's about getting the idea out there and just showing that it's possible. Spoke folks based out of Norway, Maine, certainly isn't taking the easy bicycle route to becoming environmentally responsible. It's like, wow, why are we bending over backwards when it's just so much more convenient to have a truck, right? The company uses bicycles to pick up trash instead of trucks. Our customers are folks who, who care about the environment already and, and want to do their part to help out. I think it's a lot more personal than somebody coming in a truck and picking up your trash. And I think that's kind of where it starts is that we really want to connect with our community. This takes a little more effort, but in my mind, it's nothing compared to the effort that we're going to have to do to undo global warming from depending on trucks for decades. Spoke Folks is employee owned, further giving back to the community. It keeps the money that we're making local. It benefits us, it benefits the people around us. Ecologically, it benefits the community. Beyond just picking up trash, the company is on a mission to get people to completely change the way they think about waste and how it's discarded. If we can get just one person to like think that about their trash in a new way, those ideas can spread. What would you say if we told you there was a way to care for your lawn that just wasn't good for the planet, but was also impossibly cute? Well, this next business uses nature's little landscapers, or as they're more commonly known, goats, to keep yards and parks tidy and safe. The best part, you don't even need to plug them in. Here's the honest to God truth of what happened. I called up my friend Chad and I said, I've got this idea. Hey, do you wanna buy goats with me and then have them eat people's weeds and brush? Let's see if they'll pay us to feed our goats. Does that work? And he says, yes. I said, yeah, sure. And the phone started ringing and that's when we knew we might have something. Goats on the Go is a targeted grazing operation. Our goats eat the vegetation that our customers have too much of. The first year, I remember telling Aaron, I said, look, I wanna make sure it works. 
We just did a project for free outside of Ames. The next day we came back to water them and it was like a nuclear bomb had gone off from six feet off to the ground. And I said, all right, they really will do this. Goats will eat just about everything. They'll typically eat mostly woody brush and tall broadleaf weeds. They can get up to about six feet high. The most common question we have is, did you starve them before they came? And it was like, no, that we literally just moved them from where they had food to your place. Our customers range anywhere from just homeowners all the way to conservation organizations, some business owners. We've done landfills, other public facilities, parks, you name it. Goats on the Go has affiliates in 24 territories and 11 states in the U.S. Our goats are eating invasive and nuisance plants. As they do that, they're offsetting the use of chemicals. They're also promoting native plants. They're feeding themselves on the best possible food they could have. I think we're at 640 goats right now, and we started with 12. That's just insane to me. My favorite part is that if you've ever been a parent, you always got that one punk kid that's always trying to do something. And you're like, that kid's driving me crazy. But at the same time, you're laughing. That's how goats are. It's just their whole life is to do something ridiculous. I call them the court gestures of the animal kingdom. Certainly it's a surprise to people when they're out for their walk through the park and all of a sudden there's a bunch of goats. And there's a pleasant shock to that for most folks. But once you get past the novelty of it and you start watching what the goats can actually do, I think people are really amazed. This is a real significant way to manage vegetation in a sustainable way. This doesn't work with pigs. Nobody wants pigs in their backyard. It doesn't work with cows. Nobody wants to see cows in their backyard. So half of the pitch is done and sold already because people love goats. It is so rewarding to hear from customers that they are astonished by the change. The before and after photos are what really keeps me fired up. Like in high school, it was like, oh, you played football. You know, now I'm the goat guy. I just embrace it. It's insane, it's crazy, but it pays the bills. I love it. At this gym, working out boosts not only moods, but the power too. I don't ride for miles, I ride for watts. I'm trying to save the world, baby. There is plenty of energy to go around at Eco Fitness Gym in Sacramento, California. You're gonna take your cadence all the way up to 120 to 140. Three, two, one, let's go. Every time a gym goer hops on a treadmill or a bike, their power generates the gym's power. There's an inverter on each one of these bikes, which is helping to convert uh, DC energy into AC power. On each one of the cycles, they have a little meter on here. It shows your cadence, and then in the little corner, it shows your watts, and it shows watts to the grid. The faster they go, the more power they generate. It's amazing, it's such a, a great concept, yeah. I'm really impressed with it, and the machine's really nice to run on as well. When the Eco Bikes were introduced, the gym's power bill went from nearly $700 a month to about 30. And that's not all. There are solar panels on the roof, skylights for natural lighting, and a serious commitment to not using lights unless they're needed. A lot of gyms uh, claim to be green, but we are actually doing that um, through a lot of different efforts, but especially through the creating of energy. It's like the little things, I do a little extra, and it's, you don't really think about it, but I mean, I already did 150 watts today. Something so little, but so easy, you don't really, think about it. And the ultimate prize for their power contributions? Getting fit, man, getting fit. When we come back, we're sharing stories of some fascinating ways that people are living more sustainably and helping others do the same. Stay tuned. Welcome back. For some, sustainability isn't just a part-time thing. Up next, we'll show you interesting ways that people are committing to decreasing their carbon footprint 24-7. And most of us try to keep our homes as trash-free as possible, but this unique home design uses recycled materials to create eco-efficient living spaces. We build buildings out of garbage, and they think garbage is bad. Old tires, glass bottles, and aluminum cans, these are the building blocks for Earth ships designed by Mike Reynolds. You can make, as you can see from this building, a very nice life for yourself that is not vulnerable to the corporations and the economy and the politics that are constantly 
uh, you know, in, in, in dire straits themselves. In the small community outside of Taos, New Mexico, each structure is designed to produce its own utilities. Every earthship is built with a system to collect, recycle, and distill rainwater for safe use. Solar panels provide electricity, and food comes from the built-in greenhouses, gardens, and fish ponds. We have spent 50 years not really caring to make a billion dollar business out of this, just trying to make a life for ourselves. But seeing that the whole world needs it, I need to take it to the people so they can pick their own tomatoes. Mike has worked since the 1970s to perfect and promote what he calls his Eco Disneyland. After Hurricane Maria left Puerto Rico devastated in 2018, members of the Earthship community flew down to help locals build their own eco-friendly homes. We think it's a very important effort because, you know, every time a hurricane rolls over Puerto Rico, 24 hours later, you know, they're left with nothing. We absolutely transfer our knowledge to them. That's the goal so that they can go out and yeah, maybe they're not gonna build this exact thing, but maybe they're like, hey, I could catch the water on my roof. The community has continued to expand as more and more people become aware of sustainable off the grid living. You have to be an adventurous soul to want to live here. But when you see the building we're going to, it's like, it's an oasis. In, in the world, really. Now the interest level is pretty much higher than it's ever been. Especially, Mike says, because of the coronavirus pandemic. COVID happens and people are um, waiting in lines in cars for food and I'm picking food out of the hallway. Earthship structures are now in almost every country in the world. But for their creator, it's not just about selling people an uncommon living space. It's about giving people the tools and skills they need to build their own. Anybody can gather a tire. Anybody can gather bottles and cans. Anybody can build with them. That's what we're trying to show. We're trying to educate people as to what we have learned over 50 years. I'm just scratching the surface of what can be done on this planet by humans involving themselves and, and engaging in the biology and the physics of this planet. We'd like to introduce you to a young wildlife enthusiast using his own platform to educate kids and adults on how to help animals. Hey guys, it's me, Jack, kid conservationist. He may be a kid, but viewers of all ages can learn a lot from Jack Dalton's YouTube channel. Jack makes educational videos about protecting the earth. Today, we're gonna to be talking about my favorite animal, the orangutans! I have been in love with orangutans and I've worked to get them off the endangered species list. He's been able to reach kids all over the world. Recently I talked with kids in Mexico. I've been able to talk with kids over in Spain and Hawaii. Jack was a finalist for the Time Magazine's Kid of the Year, was named Youth Ambassador to the group like the Orangutan Alliance, and is also a published author. And my book is called Kawan the Orangutan, lost in the rainforest that I wrote myself, which was so, so, so exciting. And for every book bought, a tree is planted in the rainforest. How cool is that? We're so proud of him. I mean, it's just, we. I always tell him to ha let your passion shine through and have fun in everything you do. And while he doesn't know what he wants to be when he grows up, for now, Jack is just happy being the kid conservationist and teaching others. If we protect orangutans, the animals that help the rainforest, then the rainforest helps the world, who ultimately helps ourselves. Sometimes the most valuable lessons involve getting your hands a little dirty. This next story highlights a program teaching the next generation farmers. What is it? Carrot. Pretty much you name it, we're growing it. The Mary Nash Bupre Greenhouse is part of the Alphon Youth Center there in Nashville, Maine, where hundreds of kids attend summer and after school programs. Oh, you got an orange one. We have 5,000 youth members, and to have a greenhouse uh, project in your back door so you could utilize this every single day, 12 months out of the year, you know, the kids could be in here, they're warm, and they're growing. The state-of-the-art greenhouse is an extraordinary growing and learning space. Yeah, it's not a normal greenhouse. Um, it is really its own little ecosystem. Um, we do have its own little geothermal unit. It has a thermal pond in there. Um, so during the summer, it helps cool it off. During the winter, it helps heat it. Every day, groups of children get to visit the greenhouse and learn about growing healthy and organic foods. 
teaching them how, uh, how to grow their own food, healthy food. Um, it's a life lesson that really everyone should learn and starting young is the best way. The produce from the greenhouse is used in the center's kitchen to feed hundreds of children daily. We have a lot of kids from disadvantaged circumstances and if we didn't provide a free hot meal uh, to some of these kids uh, during our uh, licensed child care program, some of them would go home uh, with uh, empty bellies. Helpful, educational, and delicious. The rewards are ripe for the picking. For the kids to have the opportunity to help themselves by grow their own organic tomatoes and cucumbers and understanding that it just takes a seed that they could grow their own uh, plants in their backyards by learning these processes here goes a long ways. After the break, we'll introduce you to some artists turning trash into treasure. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Upcycling helps reduce waste by taking something old that would have been thrown out and making it into something new. Whether it's art, furniture, or a special find, these trash to treasure stories show how a bit of creativity can breathe new life into something that might have been tossed down. In our first story, meet a fisherman and his wife who create one of a kind pieces to celebrate their home state and its long standing tradition. I grew up fishing with my father and my cousin. It's what I identify Maine as, the iconic state of Maine, um, is fishing. And I never wanted to see that go away. Taylor Stroud and his wife Nikki have known the fishing industry their entire lives. So I wanted to create a product that when people came and they visited the coast of Maine, that they could not only take something home with them, but leave something for the fishermen too. Their company, Rugged Seas, uses an unconventional material to make bags, backpacks, wallets, and even clothing. Nice. Ooh, is that? Those are like perfect shape. I want to find a way, and these bibs might be the way, to, to connect people to this industry. All made from fishermen's donated or discarded rubber bibs. Every single piece is completely different from every little scratch, every little mark. It's all gone to sea and done its job, and then we repurpose it to do another job. That's for you guys. Thank you. You're welcome. The bibs are cleaned and sold online and in local shops, an important part of the business for the Strouts. It's key to our business model to have everything stay right in Maine and to have these good relationships with the companies that we work with. Not only does their upcycled gear celebrate an iconic part of Maine, but Taylor hopes it humanizes the people on the fishing boats. Sometimes the people, a lot of people are just looking at their products, um, the lobster, the scallops, but I want to value the fishermen. I want to highlight them and their lifestyle. Next, a craftsman uses odds and ends from the past to create beautiful, bespoke art and furniture. I'm just trying to find the materials that are going to sing. For decades, Jeff Soderberg has been creating one-of-a-kind sustainable art pieces and furniture. Using only repurposed or eco-friendly materials, Jeff makes tables from storm-battered trees, benches from stone out of the Boston Harbor, and some of his materials are sourced from important parts of history. 80 pieces of the Berlin Wall, 90,000 feet of the Coney Island Boardwalk, famous shipwrecks. A success in growing my business and, and my scope has always been saying yes to things that I, I have no business saying yes to um, because I know that I'm gonna make it work. One of his most popular creations can be found swinging all over the world. This is my version of a wood and steel hammock. The Soderberg ring chair. This one is designed to swing on a pendulum. You can get in and it will never hit the wall. This design took four years and seven tries to perfect. In case the cork or other eco materials aren't for you, the ring chair can be made using materials from the Coney Island boardwalk. The hardest part is getting someone to refill your drink. One of Jeff's pieces can take months, even years to complete, but it's not all work for this artist. There's a lot of engineering, there's a lot of design, there's a lot of craft. Probably the most intriguing part of it that keeps us going is the how. Finally, we like to end with the celebration of junk. It's a festival to celebrate upcycled goods and hard to find treasures. I think a lot of people hear junk and they think, oh, it's just gonna be like a bunch of stuff that nobody wants that somebody threw away. 
you find things that normally no one would want, but now they're desirable again because someone's putting some love into it. I'm Danielle Slegelmilch. I'm the PR director at Junk Stock in Omaha, Nebraska. The best way I describe Junk Stock is it's like Woodstock meets a flea market on steroids. Junk Stock really just started as this little tiny idea. A local girl named Sarah Alexander loved to like fix things up and we met and I kind of jokingly said, hey, if you ever need help. And she's like, actually, I want to do an event. We should meet up and talk about it. Let's get Junk Stock going. We didn't know what we were really doing. We didn't have any big paid media campaign. It was just everybody really loved it. They kept coming and coming and coming and the rest is history. We have over 200 vendors, vintage, antique, repurposed vendors, and we are actually sprinkling a lot of artisan handmade products. We now have 30 food trucks. We have artisan food makers from like artisan honeys and chocolates and jerkies, cheeses from Wisconsin. Part of this dream for us was to really create like a junk stock family. And we have people that come from all over the world for junk stock. That's the only thing that blows us away is that people tell us we came from Europe and they plan their wedding on junk stock weekend so that they can come here for their honeymoon. What? That is like such an honor. We can't believe that. We have so many guests that come in that we don't even realize. Some of them are celebrity status. Some of them are like world renowned musicians. Some of them have their own TV shows. It's like such an honor that people who, they do this and they recognize kind of like the specialness of what junk stock is. I love walking around, seeing the families who are coming out and having fun and a fun, funky day is like my favorite part too. Thank you so much for joining us to celebrate the ways people are doing their part to help our planet. We hope these stories inspired you to do some good in your own part of the world. From all of us here at Stitch, thanks so much for watching.